I hope you already are getting the sense that the threshold is a decision of the <coughs> decision maker. Uh, whoever decision we're trying to inform with this analysis, that person or that entity should be the ones who give us the threshold before we even start the analysis. Uh, from an individual perspective, like we just can ask the patient, but to be honest, like if I asked you, what is your willingness to pay per quality? I don't know, do you know? I, I don't, what's my willingness to pay per quality? Um, but if we use cost effectiveness analysis for <coughs> On the, on, on the population level for policy decisions, uh, usually the decision maker would be the government, um, maybe a large health insurer, especially when we do the analysis from the societal perspective. It is pretty critical to know like, what's the societal willingness to pay threshold, which of course will be some combination of our individual thresholds, but what is the average uh, willingness to pay of <laughs> us as a society? So we'll, I'll talk mainly about that part. Um, there are various ways how to uh, estimate the threshold. Um, the easiest one um, is a former WHO recommendation is that it should be three times the GDP per capita in, in a particular country. Uh, this is per Dali, uh, gain, Dali averted, uh, but that can be easily like switched to, to quality gained. Um, I'll be honest with you, I don't know how they came up with that number. Um, and uh, the recent uh, developments in the field uh, walk away from this threshold. That it's uh, it's it's a quick number that you can easily find out by five second googling, like what's the GDP per capita, and then multiply it by three. Uh, but uh, there's the reasoning behind it is just unclear. And therefore, it's unclear why this should be the threshold. Um, another approach that is sometimes used um, is a so-called leak table. Leak table means that if we think of all the interventions that we could potentially be interested in funding, now the government can list all the services and programs and screening programs and vaccination programs and all the treatments and drugs they could potentially pay for. Uh, we would sort them uh, by ICER, from the lowest ICER to the highest. And then you know we would start funding, all right, so let's first put money in the lower, lowest ICER uh, intervention. That intervention buys health for the least amount of money. After we would satisfy everyone who needs that type of intervention, we would move to the next one, and to the next one, and to the next one, until we would run out of money. Wherever is the line where we ran out of money, that's the willingness to pay. Um, so that's, that's one approach. Do you see the problem with it? The practical problem. You would need the ICER for every, every single intervention. Those are not available <coughs> in most cases. Um, so theoretically, the, the, this works. This approach works. But uh, practically, it does not work very well. Um, now I'll sort of like move on a aside for a moment. Uh, the willingness to pay threshold is something that dictates the, the decision. So this is just like a quick summary of uh, how we make decisions based on the incremental cost effectiveness ratio. 
So if the answer is zero, uh, less than zero, that means either the numerator is negative and denominator, denominator positive or vice versa. Which means that one of the alternatives is dominant, the other one is dominated. So if you see an ICER less than zero, you just look at which one is cheaper and better, and that's, that's your decision. If the ICER is equal to zero, a, a, a ratio can be equal to zero only if the, the numerator is equal to zero. That means we have two, two uh, strategies with the same cost, but different uh, effects on health. So in that case, we would just look at which alternative brings more health for the same amount of money. Um, if the ICER is somewhere like greater than zero but less than the willingness to pay threshold, that is what we would deem cost effective. Uh, that means that one strategy is more costly but, but also brings more health. But if it's still below the willingness to pay threshold, we would consider that cost effective. If it's above the threshold, then we would deem it not worth the money. Even though the intervention brings more health, or at least one of the alternatives brings more health than the other, the incremental cost is not worth the incremental effect. Uh, if we have two equally effective strategies, the denominator would be zero, and we don't divide by zero, so the ISO would not exist. So if that happens, if you see the ISO does not exist, this may be one of the reasons. Uh, it doesn't happen very often. Uh, all right, so one, one way how to estimate a willingness to pay threshold on the societal uh, level is very similar to how we assess uh, utilities. It's, it's actually somewhat like an add-on to the same exercise. So ideally, you would recruit a sample of a representative sample from your population. And you would first assess how they value health, their utilities, for certain health conditions with one of the methods we talked about yesterday. And then, uh, as Dr. Thambu uh, briefly described yesterday, you would use the iterative bidding um, approach, usually uh, on monthly payments. You would ask people how much they would be willing to pay to get rid of that particular condition in question. Um, as with the utilities, you start at some extreme and you start increasing the, the amounts until the person says, oh, that's too much. Then you would s slowly start decreasing uh, to see um, if they can go any lower. Um, so well, one thing that I want to point out that um, I have here that the iterative bidding should be based on monthly payments. I wouldn't be really like, it doesn't have to be necessarily monthly, but I, I would recommend against using annual income, uh, which is uh, a metric often reported in the United States. Um, in Czech Republic, where I'm from, uh, when, when you ask people how much do you make, everyone will give you their monthly salary. If you ask people in the United States, they will report the annual. And even though the annual salary, like it, it looks impressive, but people still get paid every month. And because of that, most household, households work on monthly budgets. <coughs> most households pay rent every month or mortgage payment every month, phone bill every month, electricity bill every month. So people don't really understand that well what an annual income actually means. But if you narrow it down to some more tangible time interval, like a month, they can see, you know, like, could they actually, given their income, could they actually afford to pay for this additional unit of health? 
Uh, so it's it's more tangible for the respondent to actually assess the their willingness um, better. So uh, let, let, let's try to do an. Uh, yeah, so I will illustrate that in, in, in a second, uh, actually in this, this exercise. So uh, let's say you are now the respondents. So I would ask you as like one body, like what's your monthly income? Uh, you would report some number um, and then I would describe uh, some condition. In this case, let's take an example of like amputation. Uh, for example, due to diabetes. Uh, from prior research, uh, we already know that this health condition has a utility value of 0.65. Uh, we would get that the same way Dr. Carroll demonstrated yesterday in the in the video. And you know, I would describe to you that. Obviously, like amputation leads to not being able to walk without some form of assistance. Uh, there is pain associated with it, muscle con contractures, risk of thrombosis, uh, fatigue, social impact, but it doesn't really have an impact on our intellectual abilities. You can still, you know, write code, do cost effectiveness analysis. Um, so th this is our condition in question. And for just like the sake of this argument, let's say the monthly income, what is like the average income in India? Monthly, monthly income. 50,000. All right, let's go with, with 50,000 50, rupees uh, per month. That is the income, right? You also, like those people who are making 50,000, they still have some expenses. They have to pay for housing, for food, for transportation. I don't know what are the other, uh, well, uh, maybe some utilities. And so then I would ask you like, so what is, uh, what would you, would you be willing to pay 10 rupees per month to have your leg back? Yes? So now I started at an extreme. 10 rupees is a pretty darn cheap to buy your like uh, amputated leg like, back, if, if it were pos possible, of course. Uh, now going to your question. Now I will double that, that amount. How about 20? Yes. How about 40? And I will speed up a little bit. How about, you know, 5,000? Yes. Per month. Per month until the end of times, <laughs> like forever. Would you be willing to give up 5,000 rupees of your 50,000 uh, income? So 5,000, yes. 10,000? 20? <laughs> now we're getting into, you know, like now some people would still be willing to pay for the pay that, some won't. 40 out of 50,000? Maybe that's not worth it, right? So now, if you're at 40 and you're like, all right, that's, that's too much. So last time you agreed to 20, now you didn't agree to 40. So how about 30? Now I have you know, the, the difference. How about 30? I say this as a no. Uh, <laughs> so now we know 20 is our baseline, 30 is still, 20 yes, 30 no. 25? All right, let's say, 20, let's say you agree 25, but that's it, right? So now we know that 25,000 rupees, you would be willing to pay 25,000 rupees to have your leg back. Uh, so 25,000 rupees per month, that is times 12, uh, that is what, 300,000 uh, per year. Divided because now this this would this would restore your quality of life from 65 back to perfect health, which is one. So we would divide 300,000 
by 0.35. And someone do the calculation for me, please. I, this is too much to do uh, in my head. <coughs> it's like roughly a million, right? Eight fifty-seven thousand. So that would be our estimate for <coughs> this one person, <laughs> given their income of fifty thousand rupees per uh, per month. So we would have one one point. Yay! Now I would do this with many people of various incomes. I would also collect information about you know their education, about their age, sex, and so on. And ultimately, like I would adjust this. Like I, I in this case, I'm just adjusting only for or uh, for income, but the model would be adjusted for age, sex, and other other factors that can potentially influence the willingness to pay. So this is our model that shows how the willingness to pay threshold changes with income. For, and then we would find what is, what is the average Indian income. Uh, I, I think this, this actually kind of works. <laughs> uh, even in rupees, uh, I was, this was originally designed in dollars, but annual dollars. But, uh, and is this monthly or annual income? So this would be annual. Yeah. Um, Anyway, so we would find the average income, and this would be our average societal age, sex, and other factors adjusted willingness to pay threshold. Uh, so do you actually just to the patients also in the one? Yeah, you usually do this uh, with, um, with just recruited study subjects. Uh, usually those who do not have the condition. Again, as, as we talked about yesterday, like how to assess utilities, I still don't know why, what's the reasoning by asking people who do not have the condition instead of those who do. Uh, but that's, that's how, uh, how the recommendation is, uh, what the recommendation is. And um, obviously, like, the, there has been a lot of thought put into this, and people do, do studies on these studies. So we already know that um, in general, willingness to pay threshold uh, increases with income, not surprisingly. Bill Gates is willing to pay more than uh, a person from the Bronx. Um, and um, in general, um, willingness to pay threshold decreases with being prone to risky behaviors, such as smoking, uh, reckless driving, and so on. It decreases with age, uh, increases with education, what do you mean by decreases with age? Older people are less willing to pay for... Uh -huh. At least that's what the, the research suggests. That younger people are willing to spend more. I guess older people are like, nah, what the heck. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, fairly surprisingly, women are willing to pay less than men. I guess they, they can bear more. Men, 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 men are very sensitive and cannot deal with pain. Um, obviously other personal characteristics and their ge geographic variation. People in different parts of the world uh, have different willingness to pay uh, thresholds. And um, so now I have uh, some food for thought. Um, so now we estimate the willingness to pay threshold by surveys, asking people questions. Is there a way we could measure the willingness to pay threshold by observing actual behavior? And if yes, how would we do that? <laughs> Do you observe those people who, who saw the price and they're like, nah, 
this is too much. Mm -hmm. I'm not willing to spend that. No, but uh, we can average out what the average cost is for the care. If you include only those who are willing to pay, that's a big number. Yeah, we observe only those people who are actually paid. One idea which I have in mind is patients who are on dialysis in uh, renal units, uh, they have to pay a lot and at some time they make a decision that they will stop dialysis. That is uh, actually obviously they are not willing to pay uh, for the life. So if you take a, a survey of such patients, you would come to know at what income level and what age of the patient and what situation they have decided to stop the dialysis. Or at some time they shift to uh, uh, an institute where the dialysis is done. <coughs> so that also. So you know uh, that uh, they take decisions uh, to, uh, to stop these things. So at that point you can probably estimate their willingness to pay. Since uh, the questionnaire was being issued, questions are usually to the healthy people. And uh, like you said, you know the reason why that's there. Actually asking the people who are ill and who go to hospital and have an expense we may not represent it because many of the time they're not prepared by their borrowed, etc. A good uh, surrogate, I would think, is look at the uh, Amazon habits of a person as, as a proportion of their income. So people are buying things because they think it's going to make their quality of life better, either clothes or otherwise, mm -hmm. as a portion of their uh, salary. Mm -hmm. you know, if you ask them the salary and what proportion are you using for purchasing these products, would give you a, that's what you're willing to pay. He's only going to buy over and above what is about his normal expenses. And then you say if you can buy other things to buy a quality of life which is food or clothes or something. So for this is, this is really interesting, but wouldn't you need measure of the, the increase in quality of their life by buying things on Amazon? Yes, it is subjective. Yeah. But so is every yep, yep. quality thing. But, but I mean, I, I'm not, I'm not um, questioning whether or not it's subjective, but you would need that measure, right? So if, if I buy, um, I don't know, a new phone, my quality of life will increase, but by how much? Like to make the judgment, if, if given that I valued, uh, I don't know, like eight hundred dollars for a new iPhone, worth the increase in in the quality of my life, I still need the measure of the increase in the quality of my life, right? True. Yeah. Do we have a measure of the increase in quality of life because of that? Yeah. Yeah. No, the, the, this is really interesting. I, I, I like that idea. <laughs> so how about actually whoever is paid, if we take their data, we draw some conclusions from it and extrapolate it to those maybe who did by some sort of a, link some sort of a bias. Well, ideally you would have a random representative sample of the population in your study subjects. Uh, you know, th that's the that's the ideal. It probably won't happen, uh, but that is a problem of, of any kinds of studies. So, for example, if a, uh, sorry, ah. <laughs> if a patient has had amputation and he's willing to pay whatever it takes for prosthetics, uh -huh. so we can take a sample of such patients and then um, we can ask those patients, have a questionnaire and ask those patients how much are you willing to pay to get a link back or something like that, go retrospectively and ask them how much would you pay to get your limb back and depending on how much are they paying for the current situation for like uh, paying for the prosthetic limbs. Uh -huh. So uh, if we can do a study like that and we can find out the cost that they're actually incurring to whatever, to fight on for whatever disease they are actually having, like spending yeah. on the current yeah. situation. Yeah. Yeah, like uh, the deal, uh, I I agree with you, uh, but it goes back to the um, to the recommendation not to use people who actually have the condition, 
uh, which again I don't really know why, but uh, some smarter people know. Um, you're asking good questions. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we can use it as a proxy the premiums people are ready to pay for their insurance policies. Um, sure. That's a good idea. Yeah. I was also wondering about um, people's, how much they spend on their health promoting activities, which could be um, how much they um, spend on physical activities, improving their health. Yeah. What is, uh, I don't know whether that can uh -huh. Uh -huh. contribute to the willingness to pay yeah. the shoulder, reducing the risk taking uh -huh. for health. Yeah. So how much do they spend on alcohol, smoking? <coughs> yeah. Yeah, that's the thing that probably most people like to spend money on things that are not really good for their health. But, but then they're also like, they do not want to spend money on, uh, you know, like uh, exercise programs. They would prefer to spend the money on a pill that can just like do the trick. <laughs> no, it's a great, great idea. Yeah. Like we want to study the uh, uh, association with the uh, relatives and friends. We want to study the strength of uh, 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 association with friends and relatives. We put 1000 rupees in the cover, we will give it to them. So you take money, remaining will go to your friends. How much you want to be willing to go this remaining amount to your friends? Then they will take like some amount, oh, this amount can go to my friends. Another group, this money will go to your relatives. How much you want to be willing to send this money to your relatives? Sir, care sir, I don't know that the results of the studies are satisfied. On the job of the study, you have a very important study. Dr. Kaywan was the Munshi. What happened to us when she got transferred to various countries? So finally, we don't know what happened to us. That's how she go to various countries. But interestingly, when the US person goes to UK, he carries the funding with him. That's what I heard. So now we are going to somewhere with a lot of issues. We are waiting for him to come back. <laughs> Uh, can we also, uh, so nowadays uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence is a buzzword. So can we use uh, machine learning algorithms, artificial intelligence with, you know, data from social media, data from uh, the online websites, uh, even including some surveys, and then triangulate the data and come up with some threshold? Maybe. <laughs> I, I, I honestly don't know. Uh, but um, yeah, I think it's clear. Like I don't have an answer to this this uh, question. I'm just curious to hear opinions. Um, so I, I don't know, but it's it has potential. Uh, the more these days we collect so much data, so there is a chance that some algorithms will tease this out. But it is unethical. In addition to this, uh, some social Absolutely. Like in that case, it would be there. We would our data would suffer from selection bias because only people who have resources provide data to social media and stuff like that. Right. So um, that that is something that we would have to think about. Absolutely. Ask willingness to pay from uh, random people rather from the, than the disease. I think there's lots more subjectivity once you have a dear one who is diseased. Then you're willing to pay a lot, lot more than I think somebody who was 
just objectively kind of thinking about it because there's a lot more the emotional bonding and a lot of other things you can influence is I guess or either the closeness or the the distance would kind of uh, decide that willingness to play rather yeah. than just the disease itself as to how much you do. I mean I, I think it makes it more objective when it is a random sample. Thank that's objectivity. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. The other thing is uh, with clinical decision making, that's something that we often do use. We tell a patient, okay, this is how much this is going to cost, and this one is going to cost so much, and which one would you, and these are the benefits and these are the risks. And people don't take those decisions all the time based on the benefit and the risks. And there is, I don't know if there is a way to look at a willingness to do that, a decision making with the patient. For different conditions, I mean, whether it's maybe diagnosis, like we said, or ventilator support, or intensive care choices about what they get out versus what they, uh, the quality kind of gets built in mm -hmm. because of what would happen, the outcome, based on the outcome. So it could be somebody who's 85, who's got renal failure, who's got COPD, cardiac failure. You know that the outcome is not going to be great. Yeah, this is how much the cost is going to be. Then the willingness to pay threshold comes down quite a bit. From whether it's the institution side or whether it is the patient's relative side. Yeah, I, I think you raise great points that uh, if we are trying to get a societal willingness to pay, uh, we need an input from the society, not only from those who are suffering from uh, from each particular condition. Um, also, I, I know if this was clear, so I gave you the, this example with like amputation. Uh, researchers who would be working on establishing the willingness to pay threshold would use a set of different conditions uh, to also um, control for personal feelings about certain conditions uh, so to get just like the overall sense of uh, willingness to pay per quality as a, as a general metric. Good, this was really good. I, I like this, but this was all I had. Oh, there's more.